morning, everyone. Welcome to the library at Calvary Road Baptist Church in the city of Monrovia. We are located in the gulag known as Los Angeles County at the south end of the People's Republic of California, presided over uh, by General Secretary Gavin uh, Kim Jong Newsom. And uh, in the state of California, they have apparently recorded uh, one, uh, 1 1.9 million signatures to recall Gavin uh, Worrisome, and he must be a little bit worried. He's appearing on all the mainstream media sources talking about how those who are opposed to him are radical Republicans, uh, QAnon weirdos, uh, members of the 3%, and Newt Gingrich. Um, I don't think it's any of that. I think it's people who are just fed up of being told what to do uh, by guys that don't practice what they preach. And um, it turns out that some 40% of those who've signed the recall petition are registered Democrats. So it's not, a, uh, it's not so much a, um, uh, a hardline conservative thing as it is a bipartisan grassroots, uh, let's get rid of this elitist who is a member of the four families that have almost completely controlled California for over a hundred years. This nephew of former JFK girlfriend, Nancy Pelosi. Um, but that's just the political world and we're involved in ministry. Uh, this is my weekly Saturday night Zoom session, and because of the, um, the consequences of the pandemic, uh, I had someone in the city of Monrovia accuse me of being a racist for referring to the pandemic the way the CCP referred to the pandemic in the beginning as the Wuhan virus. And she said, we can tell everything we need to know about you by the way you label it. And <laughs> so to call something what it was originally called and not to call it what its latest iteration of politically correct terminology is uh, makes me uh, a racist. Okay, uh, be that as it may, come to our auditorium and look around and you would be very hard pressed to find evidence of um, um, uh, ethnic favoritism or, or, or discrimination. <laughs> we, uh, we're not as diverse as we used to be, uh, simply because some of the people moved out of the state of California. But at one time, uh, we had members of our church from 22 different uh, nations of origin uh, all across the globe and from every, from every continent. So basically, we're into Martin Luther King kind of stuff, uh, the content of character. That's the critical thing with us. That's important. That's the reason we love the Savior, because nobody had better character than he, the sinless son of the living God, born of the Virgin Mary, uh, lived 33 and a half years among men, died on the cross for our sins, rose victorious from the dead uh, three days later, and is now uh, enthroned at the right hand of the Father on high. Think about it, people. A man sits on the throne of the universe, and he is our soon-to-return Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, because of these um, pandemic lockdowns, travel restrictions, and all this kind of thing, um, our annual Missions Emphasis Month would have been quite difficult for us to get more than perhaps one or two missionaries that we have supported uh, to visit our facilities here in, um, in Los Angeles Gulag. So what I decided to do was make use of this technology. And for the last several weeks, we have had Zoom sessions with missionaries that our church has supported. And uh, this evening, uh, although I'm recording this Thursday morning at 10 o'clock, this, this is going to be made available to people uh, Saturday evening at 7 p.m. And so uh, I, I have joining with me uh, Pat Coleman, uh, born and raised just south of here in Bellflower, California. Uh, I very much enjoyed um, an ongoing friendship with his, uh, with his lovely mother and father uh, before they were promoted to glory. And um, 
Uh, it's a delight to have Pat Coleman with us uh, at this time. Pat, uh, nice to have you aboard. And isn't technology a wonderful thing? <laughs> I, I'm loving this. Uh, the fact that I can be with you literally on the other side of the planet is a phenomenal thing. I remember Even from the back, middle of Africa. I remember back in the day when all the emails sent to you had to be small because yeah. your, your connection was so uh, limited that yeah. if somebody was going to send you even a photo, it took such a long, long time to download. And yeah. so apparently more of those uh, issues are, are solved, and I praise God for it. How you doing, buddy? Well, I'm doing better than I was five weeks ago. Yeah. Um, I, I was at the church mowing the lawn, as a matter of fact, because I like being outside, and it gave me a chance to do some exercise. And during the covid uh, we can't go to the only gym in town, so I was doing the cutting the lawn, twisted my back, and my sciatic nerve was like an electric shock, and uh, I put the lawnmower away, hobbled, got into my car, and drove the little over half a mile back to the house. Uh, it took me 15 minutes because I couldn't twitch, twist the, the pedals, got home, and stayed the next four days in bed so i have gone from bed to wheelchair to walker to cane so i'm doing better i'm glad you're doing better man i i'm so glad so is my wife she was taking care of me so now she she can you know let me do some of my own stuff <laughs> yeah 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 uh and 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 so glad you're in in good spirits uh you you seem to be one of the um, most encouraging and encouraged missionaries that I know, because uh, you you seem to be at least in 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 on the many occasions that I've had contact with you, you seem to be very responsive to the mandate of James to count it all joy. Um, and you know, like the old the old uh, Negro deacon in the Deep South many many years ago, when asked what was his favorite uh, portion of scripture, he said it came to pass. So whatever it is, it's just moving through. So you might as well just get on with it. So uh, welcome, my brother. Um, Thank you. We have we have a number of, of uh, new members and people attending um, since you were last here. And so I'm wondering if you would give us uh, basically introduce yourself to them um, as a missionary introduces himself or herself to uh, to supporters for the very first time. Okay, well, first of all, I'm glad you got new faces in the congregation. That's always a good sign. Uh, I hear uh, of a lot of churches who are suffering and it's not just COVID, they're just shrinking. So the fact that you've got new faces in the congregation is wonderful. I was born, as, as you said, uh, in, in uh, well, actually born in Whittier, raised in Norwalk and Bellflower. Uh, back in 1954, I was 10 days old, my first Sunday in church, mm -hmm. 10 days. My mother used to say I didn't get much out of the message, but I did add a lot to the service. Yes. Uh, so I'm the firstborn of four sons, a very Irish family. So yesterday was, was St. Patrick's Day. I was named for St. Patrick. All of my brothers have Bible names. I have the name of a saint. Uh, and I wore my orange shirt. So there you go. Orange, uh, yes, Matt. Yes, sir. Orange. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, as I said, was in church from the from ten days old. I was uh, I came to know the Lord as my Savior at the age of four, and my, both of my parents were Sunday school teachers, and I literally heard it all the time. My father was a youth worker, and we always had young people in the in the house, and I heard the the Bible stories. I knew them. Uh, I understood what it meant to be a lost sinner at the age of four. I was baptized a few weeks later at the age of five. I surrendered to preach uh, during a revival meeting with, um, with Art Wilson at Calvary Baptist Church in Bellflower wow. at the age of 10. Wow. So, uh, and then I, 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 I preached my first sermon in junior church at, that, at Calvary uh, when I was 13. So I've literally grown up like Samuel in the church. Uh, went off to Bible college when I, uh, well, I just turned 18, off to Bible college. Um, took the missions course because 
Uh, the girl that I liked at the time was taking missions. So, and the missions of course. course, missions course, and the and the pastors course in the first year were basically the same. Uh, so I took the missions course, never dreaming that I would end up in Africa. In fact, at youth camp, and I was in high school, we had uh, Jack Baskin come and preach at the at the camp, um, and uh, everybody wanted to go to mission mission field. Everybody was going to mission field except me. I surrendered to be a pastor so I could support them. I said, somebody's got to stay here, right? Because you go where God calls you. And I did not feel God or Jack Baskin calling me to the mission field. Um, interestingly enough, none of those guys went to the mission field. Here I am. So uh, God's, you know, as, as we say, man plans and God laughs. Uh, so after Bible college, I worked in uh, Virginia uh, at a small church and built up the youth group there, working with teenagers. I went from there to uh, Tennessee um, for eight of the longest months of my life. And I learned there, John, that racism does exist even in Baptist churches. It does. It really does. Oh, yes. I, I was stunned when I heard it. The pastor made a comment and I, my mouth dropped open and I said, do you know where I'm from? Uh, when we've got our church, like Calvary Road, was was multicultural. Uh, we we had all all flavors and all nationalities in the church, and I couldn't deal with that. So I went from there to Indiana, where I became a, a school teacher, and then ultimately the principal of a Christian school in Bloomington, Indiana. And then everything was going great. The the, the youth group was uh, you know the church didn't pay me, the school did, but I worked in the youth group. And uh, the youth group tripled. The school was doing well. Uh, our school teams were doing well athletically. Uh, it was fantastic. Everything was good. You know, I, I had a house, uh, two kids and a dog. I mean, it was the American dream. I drove a Buick. I was, it was wonderful. And then Ray Crocker, missionary to Singapore, came to visit the church because the church supported Ray. And I was showing him around. And I said, this is what I do. And this is this and that. He said, this is pretty good. Uh, what can you do outside your, your comfort zone? I said, what do you mean outside my comfort zone? I built my comfort zone. I like my comfort zone. It is my comfort zone. He said, yeah, but, and this was his comment, anybody can do this. I said, what do you mean anybody can do this? Look what's going on. I'm having a great time. God's blessing. It's wonderful. And, and, and everything's working. No problems. He said, yeah, but what can you do outside your comfort? And I said, Okay, Ray, you're a missionary. You're supposed to say that, right? Good. <laughs> so you've said it. Thank you very much. He said, well, just, just pray about it. Just pray about it. So I said, fine. So I prayed about it. And I said, God, you don't want me to go to the mission field, do you? That's how I prayed. Uh, but three or four nights later, after not being able to sleep, I realized that God really was working on me. So I called the missions office and I said, if you had a volunteer, maybe, you know, three, four years, short term, and uh, uh, had a background in education, working with young people, uh, had a background in, uh, in music, and, and took French in high school, where would you send them? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, uh, the missionary to Zaire, Elmer Deal, just contacted us and he needs some help. And I said, great, where is Zaire? Literally, I had no clue. And they said, well, it's Belgian Congo. And I said, I'm going to be a missionary to the Belgian Congo. Now, there you go. So we looked it up. We did all the, all the paperwork. And in 1984, in May, we were approved as missionaries. 13 months later, we arrived in Kinshasa and then on to Lubumbashi in Zaire. And again, we didn't realize it was going to be this long because most missionaries stay generally seven years at the average um, because your kids grow up and they want to go to school and so on and so on. But uh, 1985 has become uh, 2021 and 36 years later, I'm still here. Yeah, uh, it, it, was, it was not always easy. Uh, they, 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 a war began in Zaire. I helped to evacuate some 35 families from various backgrounds, Peace Corps and various church groups and and so on, helped them evacuate out. And then I followed them in, in Zambia, came into Zambia. 
we met the president of Zambia at the time, Kenneth Kaunda, uh, at a hotel. Uh, and he invited me to stay in Zambia. And I said, thank you for the invitation. This was 1991. Thank you for the invitation, but my heart is in Zaire. He said, okay, just pray about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we did. And, uh, you know, but again, I, I was happy in Zaire until I wasn't. I kept going back and forth from Zambia into Zaire. And the thing, be, the situation became very difficult for the Zaireans because the president, Mabutu Sesaseko, hated Americans. And I was going into Lubumbashi. I was working with the, because I spoke Swahili and French. I was working with the pastors and they said to, to me, uh, your presence here puts us in danger because the government knows you are an American. And I, you know, so I ended up in Zambia uh, and didn't know what I was gonna do here, but began working with local church, a local church, because there wasn't any more than one local church. And I said, okay, well, in, in Zaire, I started 15 or 16 churches, 15 or 16 because they didn't all stay, sorry, uh, that's the way it works. But I began working with different groups in, in this town of Luancha, little tiny mining town. And uh, I got all excited and I was talking to my wife. We were on the way to the city near us to pick up air tickets so our daughter, we go to our daughter's graduation in Kenya. She was going to Rift Valley Academy. Uh, so on the way to, to that town, we were hit by a drunk driver and Cindy was killed. Vehicle was flipped, demolished, and uh, our youngest son, Colin, was in the back seat. Had two broken legs, um, and I was—I had over a hundred pieces of glass in my face and shoulders. Uh, my seatbelt uh, was intact. Cindy's seatbelt was in shreds, and it literally—it it hit his broadside on her side of the vehicle, so she was gone. And went back to the states because we had talked about, you know, the what ifs. Most missionaries talk about the what ifs. If something happens, what do you want done? And she, Cindy and I had talked about this. And, and I said, well, if I die in, in Zaire, you just put me in the garden uh, because it's just a body. She said, no, 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 no. She said, the children will want to go and, and see. And I said, well, that's just, that's just gross. But you said, no, nope, no. Nope. So I knew what she wanted. So I took her back to the States, uh, her body, buried her uh, in, in Forest Lawn in Southern California. And then... Uh, eight weeks later, came back to Zambia, and it's been a it's been a, a challenge at times. Uh, three years later, I met and married another missionary who was here, Sherry Welsh. She became Sherry Coleman. Um, interesting story about that, but we'll cover it another time. She became when she married me, and Colin wanted her to marry me. He yes. told me, uh, but when she married me, she became wife, mother, and grandmother because. Our oldest son, my oldest son, uh, his wife had just had a, a baby uh, who is now 23 years old um, and in, in uh, finished university. So they all came for the wedding. So she had suddenly gone from uh, what they call here a spinster, <laughs> unmarried woman, to a wife, mother, and grandmother. One failed swoop. So uh, our ministry has, has expanded. I'm still doing church planning and counseling and, uh, and uh, uh, leadership training. She had a correspondence Bible school. She still does. Yes. She, uh, she has a, uh, we built, we, we bought a, a building in town and put all the books, like the ones behind you, all of our books are on display and people can come and read them because people can't afford to buy them. So they come and read them for free. It's called the Christian Resource Center. And uh, uh, then, and, and again, Back behind that is the youth center where young people can come and enjoy the recreation in a safe environment. So we're still doing more and it's, it's expanding. So many areas of ministry, John, that if I begin talking about it, it will take the entire hour. But suffice to say, our ministry has grown in spite of the opposition, and there's been plenty, in spite of the knives in the back, and there's always knives in the back. But God is blessed and continues to bless. So we're looking forward to seeing what God does next. Even this year, 
even with my, my back situation, God has blessed with yet a new ministry, uh, which, is, which is taking off like a house fire. So it's exciting to be a part of what God wants us to do, where God wants us to be, and follow the open doors that he leads us through. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's absolutely wonderful. And, and how has directly um, uh, the, uh, the COVID lockdown affected your ministry there? When COVID first came to Zambia, first of all, the government denied it existed. You know, it's not going to affect us. They said it's the European disease. So it's not going to come to Africa because it's a European disease. And I said, yeah, but people are going back and forth between Africa, Asia, and, and, and Zambia. Well, the first came, the first case came from Pakistan. A man came uh, from Pakistan, brought the case to Zambia, and so they quarantined him, but no one, no one really cared about it. it was no, still, it was an outside disease. When it became apparent that it was spreading, uh, they began to lock everything down. Now, in the United States, churches have a certain level of freedom because of the Constitution. In Zambia, everything is controlled by the state. So when the state says you cannot meet as a church, we can't meet as a church. Yeah. So I would go um, to the church on, um, on, a, on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday afternoon, and I would tell people, I'm going. If you want to come and just chat, come and chat. So people would show up, but we didn't have a church service. We couldn't go inside the building. So we're meeting outside in our little outdoor, uh, like a patio, and we're, we're having conversations, but people are being very far apart. There's no singing because it would draw a crowd, draw attention. So we had to be very, uh, very careful about how we did things and keep it very low key because that, that was the law. We had no choice. Ultimately, we got permission to meet for an hour, but only, only 40 people in the room, no children. Everybody wore a mask, sanitizer at the door. So I wear a mask every day, sanitizer and so on. Uh, and that's, that's just the way it's gonna be. Now we can meet for two hours. So slowly it's lightening up. But having said that, we're coming into election season. In about four months, we're going to be have four, five months, I guess. We're going to have an election in Zambia, and everything's going to go out the window because yeah. you're not going to get people in, in small groups. And the idea of physical distancing, I, I use that instead of social distancing because you and I are being socially close now, which is kind of cool. But physically distancing people isn't going to work. It doesn't work in Zambia. People get on a on a on a get in a twelve seater bus, and there's eighteen of them. Yeah, uh, there's not the social distancing or physical distancing. So uh, now they're talking about the second or third wave coming back into Zambia, and people are afraid because now politicians are getting sick. And a few weeks ago, uh, one of the Catholic bishops in Zambia died of COVID. So they're now realizing that it's real. Those of us who are wearing the mask and are staying apart from each other, uh, we're, we're, we're safer than people who are coming close. But we still have people who say it doesn't exist. It's a, it's a European disease. The Americans are trying to kill us or well, the Chinese are trying to kill us. And I said, you know, it's just a disease. Okay, Take precautions, wash your hands, wear the mask, stay away from people uh, and, and, and be smart. It's the same with, like we're talking about, it's the same with the flu. If you stay away from people with the flu, you don't get the flu. Yeah. So it, it's, we're just being careful. So like I said earlier, Sherry had, had COVID in July, bad case, no smelling, no taste. Uh, and it took her about three months to get over it. I had a very mild case. It was basically like a light flu, um, but that was all it was. Vaccines are not here. And might not be here until end of the year. Um, so we're just, we're just playing it by ear. Yeah, yeah. I, um, in uh, November of 2019, I made my annual trek to Nepal. There is a Nepalese uh, Baptist church planter that used to be a Maoist revolutionary. Right, I, and, I, I remember the story. Yeah, and uh, so I, I preached for him and I had... Uh, my wife and, and another couple and another preacher with me, we flew back, uh, changed planes in China, 
flew back on an A380. And as soon as we touched down, uh, everybody in my party got sick except my wife. And um, one of the guys lost his sense of smell and taste for about a month. I had a really bad, unproductive cough. I couldn't speak <coughs> without <coughs> coughing. And so I went to a pulmonologist and uh, he gave me a prescription. He said, you're in, a, you're, in a, you're in a feedback loop, a metabolic feedback loop. And he said, let me give you this prescription because you're almost out of this cough now. So use this prescription the next time. Don't use it now. It would be a waste. Use it next time. And, uh, and then I went back to see him for a routine checkup about six months later. And I said, Doc, uh, you know, when I was here before, he said, yeah, yeah, I think you had it. Uh, he said, we didn't know what it was at the time, uh, but you had the classic unproductive cough. Uh, so you probably had a, a fairly mild version of it. So I, am, I was one of about uh, 5,000 people a week who were flying into California from China. Uh, and that's how California got it. So um, uh, as soon as the lockdown order came from uh, Governor Kim Jong Newsom, um, of course, all of our people immediately stayed home except for me and, and the, the production crew. They're at the other end of the auditorium and I'm, I'm conducting live stream services. And, uh, and so I'm, doing, I'm just doing the regular Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday, just like you were doing. Only I was doing it inside with two people at the other end of the room. And after a while, I got a call from a guy and he said, Pastor, I said, yeah. He's, Cause it had no effect on my life. I just do what I would do anyway. It's right. just that there were no other people around. Right. And, um, and he said, uh, what would you do if I came to the auditorium? I said, I'm, I'm not law enforcement. Yeah. I said, um, I'm a Baptist preacher and Baptists uh, claim to believe in soul liberty. They frequently don't, but they claim to. Uh, yeah. I said, so I'm not going to tell you whether to come or whether not to. Uh, I'm going to be there. You show up fine. And so basically people began trickling back. Eventually, I got a call from someone who says, is there somebody in the auditorium? It sounds like there's people in the auditorium. When you try to tell jokes, people are laughing. And I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, there are people in the auditorium. And, and the real- When you try uh, to tell jokes, I love that. When you yeah, try to tell jokes. You try to tell jokes. <laughs> so uh, the, our first encounter was the, the, the Sunday of the lockdown order. We had, of course, the whole parking lot was full of people after church. And a next door neighbor called the police and said, uh, there, there's someone in the auditorium at Calvary Road Baptist Church, or excuse me, in the parking lot of Calvary Road Baptist Church. There is an adult female who is illegally and dangerously violating the safe space of a child. And they What's dispatched that? officers to come. And the officer concluded that, yes, in fact, a woman did hug her son. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the that was the violation of safe distancing, um, and so uh, it's it's gradually it's gradually. Uh, but we've had uh, we've got people visiting the church who had had never been here before, but who saw our live stream video and and YouTube channel, and so we we praise God for that. the The challenge for us is trying to figure out how we renew our our desire to penetrate the community right. because now of course everybody is afraid of somebody who approaches them and yeah. uh so it's it's a challenge and that we have you know here and there but uh when you were talking about being in zaire uh, i don't think very many people in the united states uh know enough of their history to realize that Belgium was one of the most racist colonizers in the history of mankind. Yeah, they were uh, tell, us a, tell us a little bit about that from your perspective as having been in the Belgian, what used to be the Belgian Congo. Well, King Leopold, yes. King Leopold of Belgium, uh, 
the Belgian Congo was his personal property. It was not a, a Belgian colony like the Brits had colonies and the French had colonies. The Belgian Congo was his personal property. And the copper, the diamonds, the, the other things, the cobalt and so on uh, in Zaire belonged personally to him. So when he didn't get what he wanted, he would do whatever it took to get more. And uh, if the if the miners, and these are all, again, black, Zambi, uh, black Zairean, or black Congolese back in those days, if they didn't get enough copper out of the ground, they'd cut off their hand. So you'd have a bushel basket, literally a basket full of hands. And that was supposed to get people to work more. Well, you can't work harder when you've only got one hand, but this is the, the mentality of King Leopold. He was incredibly cruel. When, when Belgian Congo became independent in 1960, the only university graduate was Patrice Lumumba. Well, Patrice Lumumba was, was courted by the communists. Yeah. He was not a communist because he <laughs> knew it, it wouldn't work. Uh, and I've read his story. Um, but he, he said, at least they're going to give me, going to give us a, a chance to be independent. He did not realize that that wasn't ever going to happen. But then he was murdered. So the only university graduate in Congo at the time was murdered. Uh, so the, the, the situation was very tenuous. Um, and it became very, very unsafe for a European. So the Belgians, who were in charge of everything, literally ran away, left their houses, their vehicles, their shops. They ran away, and the, the, the shops and everything were taken over by, by the workers. Well, again, the workers were not, they were not uh, uh, accountants. They were not you know, merchants. They were just workers. Well, it wasn't long before everything in the shops was empty. And people scratch their head and say, well, who's bringing more stuff? Because they didn't know how to order, how to, how to restock. So it became a very difficult situation. Enter a number of, of leaders, including Mobutu Sese Seko, uh, who was a tyrant and put in, into power by Western leaders because he would do what they asked him to do. He became one of the richest men in the world. And if you, if you said anything against him, you died. In fact, while we were in Zaire in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, uh, soldiers from Mobutu's tribe came into the university in Lubumbashi and slaughtered hundreds of students. Uh, there was blood on the wall all the way to the ceiling. They took the bodies out and they, and they dumped them in the forest. So this was the kind of situation you have when, when the, the, only, the only focus is your pocket. Um, it is not that way in Zambia. It's a whole different world in Zambia. Uh, Zaire is still struggling, Zaire, uh, DRC now. It is still struggling, but it's not as bad as it was under the Belgians or under Mobutu. So people are now more educated and they demand more. And of course, the internet and cell phones have changed the world because even in places like Myanmar, uh, you, you find people, bad things are happening and it's on camera. Yes. Uh, people are, you know, because people can't hide these things anymore like they used to. There's still bad things happening, uh, but it's not as hidden as it used to be. And believers are now being able to take advantage of this same technology. I mean, my wife's in the other room having a, a, a discipleship class on Zoom with a young lady who's 400 miles away from us. Yeah. She's from here, but she got, she got transferred away. So we're finding this technology idea. Everybody's got a phone. Not, not everybody has a computer, but they use WhatsApp, which yes. is a way to communicate. Uh, and and it, it's a phenomenal thing to see what's happening. So Zaire was a mess. It is still not completely settled, uh, but it's better than it used to be. Now, your ministry in Zaire was French and Swahili. What yes. language uh, do you use where you're currently at? Well, I'm still working with, with Congolese refugees. 
So almost every day, well, before COVID, before the accident, almost every day I use Swahili and some French. But when I walk into a refugee area and I speak Swahili, because I speak it like they do, everybody, you know, they lighten up. Oh, well, yeah, of course. You're speaking my language. Yeah. Uh, one of one of our workers, one of the our, my, I, I say our workers, they're not mine, we're co-workers, because I work with Africans, they don't work for me. One of the men with whom I work, that's better, said, the only problem with you is that when God made you, he ran out of ink. Yes. Because you're, <laughs> you are an African. Yeah, you because are, I you speak, are. I speak Swahili like they do. I eat with my fingers. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and so we, we assimilate as much as we can. Yes, I'm still an American. I'm not changing my, my, my uh, citizenship because it wouldn't do me any, any, give me any advantage. But we work with people as equals. Several years ago, John, a, a, a man came to visit. We don't get many visitors here because, A, it's expensive. Uh, and B, there's, where we are, there's nothing tourism -ish. There's nothing to see. So if you're going to come here, you're going to have to be with me. And we're going to run around and do what I do. Well, he came, and the first day he stayed with me. The second day he slept until 10 o'clock because he was tired. But he watched me work with the various leaders, church leaders, and, and people in town. And he said, you, uh, you treat them like they're equal. And I said, I beg your pardon? He said, well, you, 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 you treat them like they're equal. And I said, I don't know where you're from, but I know where I'm from. And these people are my friends. Uh, my doctor is an African. My lawyer is an African. The lady who cuts my hair is an African. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm more comfortable here than I would be even in America because I've been here over half of my life. And I said, I, I, I resent what you just said. And he said, well, where I'm from, and it was a very racial comment. And I said, you know, you've been helping us in our ministry, and I appreciate that, but I don't think I want your money. What? And I said, I can't work with racists. Sorry, I, I just yeah. can't. Yeah. And he was very, he was offended. And I said, I'm offended. Well, he left the next day, got on the plane and went wherever he was going to go. But I, I just, I don't do racism. It's just, it's wrong. I it's hear a you. Sin. I, I hear you. You know, when I, uh, when I, I grew up on Indian reservations around the USA yeah. right. and I did not come to Christ until after I had graduated engineering school. But one of the things that I noticed on the Indian reservations as I was growing up was the singular lack of success of virtually every missionary. Yeah. And, and I did not, I was not able to verbalize it while I was observing it, but upon reflection, uh, it became clear to me that the reason they met with no success was that they had a patronizing attitude toward the people they were ministering to. Well, I had a, a missionary and, uh, lady tell me, uh, all the Zambians are like children. You treat them like children, they'll do what you want them to do. And I said, you, you need to go home. Yeah, yeah. Again, I mean, you, honestly, you, you need not to be here. Absolutely. Uh, because that, that, I'm sorry, that's just wrong. And, she, and again, she got offended. And I said, you're offending me. These are my friends. These are the people God sent me to train. And I'm, they don't work for me. Right. I train. And, and for me, John, one of the ugliest things in the world is for someone to build a beautiful church building and not take the scaffolding down. You know, leave the scaffolding up there. Well, the scaffolding is ugly. It serves a purpose, but when the building is finished, take it down and get it out of the way. And I see a lot of people, and I say this very carefully, because I don't know who's going to watch this, but a lot of people build something and never leave it. And it's always theirs. So their hands are always on it. The scaffolding never comes down. And the beauty of the indigenous local uh, Bible preaching, Bible believing church is never seen because the scaffolding is still up. Well, here in, in Zambia, I've started another 15 churches. Uh, I'm not the pastor of any of them. Yeah. Uh, the, the English speaking church in town here uh, has a young pastor. I trained him. In fact, I raised him. He was one of our orphans. Um, he's a teacher. Church doesn't pay him. He's a school teacher. His wife is a school teacher. Uh, the church helps, 
because of expenses he wouldn't have if he wasn't pastoring the church. But it's like in the New Testament where Peter was a fisherman. Uh, Paul was a tent maker. So, you know, the idea is you work with people. And I'm not saying that a, a, a full-time pastor is, is wrong. But here, uh, full-time pastors basically sit around and wait for the check to show up. Well, you will love it. Uh, the guy in Nepal supported himself for years by, by running a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> we don't have one of those it. here. <laughs> I love it. And he was getting ready to buy a piece of land to relocate his Christian school. And he found out from a geologist that he had a million dollars worth of clay on the land that could be made into bricks with a brick kiln. And so wow. he, he, he bought it and he put up a brick factory. Uh, he said, because the land will be there once the, once the clay is gone. Yeah. And we'll make it into a school once the clay is gone. And I've gotten as much money out of this. And, and everything he gets goes into the ministry. Um, but hasn't there always been since the, day of, the days of William Carey, there has always been a tension between those uh, on the mission field and those providing money because those who provide money always feel a sense of ownership, like they ought to have the right to control how the money is spent. <laughs> right. well, again, another, another mystery asked me one day, how many churches do you have? And I said, I, I don't understand the question. How many churches do you have? I said, I don't have any. He said, well, but how many, how many do you control? I said, I don't control any. I'm, I'm, at that time, I'm, I said, I'm pastoring one, but I'm training my successor. Because even when I spoke to a congregation in the States, and they said, what would you do if you pastored in America? What would be your, your first priority? And I said, train my successor. Because that's all I've ever done. Because someday, I'm going to be too old, too crippled, or too dead to continue. And I want the ministry to continue without me. So I said, I don't have any churches. He said, well, what happens if the churches that you're working with, if whatever, if they go bad? And I said, what do you mean if they go bad? He said, you know, they, they get involved in, in heresy. I said, well, what happens in America if the church you're from falls into heresy? Oh, it wouldn't happen. I said, my friend, your, your history lessons need to be upgraded because Bible colleges from, from 100 years ago are no longer Bible colleges and churches that were God preaching, God believing churches don't exist. So it can happen to anybody. We need to train our successor. So I train leaders. I get them involved in ministry. I, I, and when I start a church, it's always with an African. I don't go out and do it under a tree. Right. It, it, I have to have somebody with me. I help them. They're working or I help them initially. Um, and then they build the church. And then I go back as an invited guest. They invite me to come and teach. So again, before COVID, I was preaching in four or five different churches every month at their invitation because it's the church that needs to invite me. I don't just show up. And the missionary, or the missionary, the evangelist with whom I work on a regular basis, he speaks Swahili, I speak Swahili, so, and he speaks another language and we both speak English. So I, I travel with him. His name is Gilbert Simwanza. He's 78 years old. He wants to die in ministry. Um, it, it, he's a phenomenal old man. He said to me last month before I hurt myself, he said, you're so different from the other missionaries. And I thought, uh oh, what have I done now? And he said, well, you don't want to be in charge. I said, I'm not in charge. I'm not in charge. These churches belong to Jesus Christ. He's the, the cornerstone. He's the head. We serve God. You don't, I, I said, don't ever say you believe something because I said it. Even in the Bible college, I yeah. tell our students, I don't care where you go to church. In this room, it's the old adage that, that I learned from Bob Hughes. The Bible says. And I heard that way back in Bible college when I was in Bible college. And I said, it's not a matter of what your church says. What does the Bible say? Because even amongst what we would consider to be fundamental denominational, denominational churches, and there are several, even amongst those groups, you have heresy. Yes. So I said, it's the Bible. 
And if I say something, and this is to my students, and they're all there with their Bibles and their cell phones and their Google, because we have Google here too. If I say something that is not biblic biblically correct, I want you to put your hand up and say, Dr. Coleman, my Bible says X, and we'll talk about it. We'll discuss it. But don't stop me in the middle of class and say, Dr. Coleman, my pastor says, or my church says, because I don't care. Yeah, that's so good. the only way, the only way we're going to see indigenous churches grow is to train the leaders and get out of the way. And John, they don't do church like, like Americans. They do not do church like Americans. And that's okay, because I don't think the church in Jerusalem did church like Americans. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what are your present most pressing needs that it would be good for us to be aware of, to pray about, and, and to try to help out with? Well, the doctor told me this sciatic nerve issue is going to take another three months. So I'm basically homebound to the point where I can't drive anywhere. So Sherry has to drive me. So number one is basically this, this my health. And I, you know, I never, I never thought that I would get to the point where I literally couldn't walk around the house without a cane, but here I am. So that's number one. Number two, our Bible, college, Bible Institute, and by the way, the Institute is being directed by an African, and as it should be. So um, my wife and I are both lecturers in the Bible College that is being administered by Africans, again, as it should be. Uh, we need some stuff done. Uh, we need some repair work. Like every other building, uh, on the planet, they fall apart. Uh, so we need we need some window panes. We need flooring done. We need some desks. So generally speaking, it's just maintenance on these buildings. The buildings were built by students because it's also a a vocational school. Um, but and the, and students are doing the repair work. But that's number two on our list. Uh, we just need stuff to make the place nice. We we actually had um, a team from the from the government come in and say. You need to do this and this and this and this and this. So we've begun that process. And in that process included, uh, you can't have breeze bricks. You must have glass window panes, which makes no sense because window panes break and breeze bricks do not. But uh, that's that was the rule. So and then we need uh, we need to fix the flooring because it was concrete and they wanted tiles and little things like that. There's always something when, when the government comes in and says, we're going to help you. It's always yeah. going to cost you. Yes. Well, you know, your the ministry there, the school sounds very much like uh, uh, Booker T. Washington and uh, the Tuskegee Institute. Yeah, 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 exactly right. I read that book last year. Yeah, it was a great book. He was a great man. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we're so training, I we're training laborers, well, actually artisans. They're being certified as bricklayers or carpenters or whatever. And then my wife and I teach the Bible courses. The idea is these young men, and they're not all going to be preachers and pastors. Yes. But these young men and women, because we've got ladies in the class as well, they will go out into the community as builders, but be able to proclaim the gospel of Christ. Because that's how we win people. People Generally, people don't go to church uh, without being asked. Someone has to prepare the soil. You know, when the Bible talks about in the in the in the parable of the the good seed and bad soil, uh, all those soils will produce fruit, but only one will. Why? No one's work the soil. Yes. Yes. Uh, and and I, when I teach this, I tell people the seed is always the seed. The problem is the soil hasn't been worked. So let's break up the path. Let's remove the stones and use those stones for a wall. Let's remove the, 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 the weeds and use it as compost. So there's always a way of making it work. Yeah. Let's make the soil well. So these young people who leave school, the idea is they leave school, they go into the building community, the building industry, and they, when they're talking to their fellow workers, they can talk about Christ. It is a beautiful example of what Paul did as a, as a, a tent maker with his team of tent makers and, and others who worked with him. Yeah, amen, amen. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's tremendous, that's encouraging, that's strategically sound, uh, and, and it's beneficial. 
Um, and I, um, I'm so glad we had an opportunity to have this kind of a chat today. And um, I'm, I'm a little, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry uh, for a couple of reasons that your, that your dad passed. Uh, number mm -hmm. one, I, I, I liked the guy and loved him tremendously um, and was sorry to see him go. I, I remember uh, another preacher here in Southern California and I would go and see your dad and uh, we'd go out to eat. And uh, we had a delightful time and uh and he was one of the reasons you came to california more frequently and oh, so yeah. <laughs> so you you're going to be less inclined to come to california in the future than you were in the past and that makes well, me a little sad i have but, i have a number of solid supporting churches in california I'm, my home church is still there yeah uh, so i'll be back uh yeah. but again I'm, i've got grandchildren in the midwest and i've got a granddaughter a beautiful granddaughter in Washington State, uh, who is the daughter of the little boy who was in the car when, when Cindy was killed. Yeah. Uh, he's now a tech sergeant in the United States Air Force, and he's stationed in Washington State. And I've never seen my granddaughter except on Zoom. I so see. when we are open to travel, I'll be on the West Coast. <laughs> that, that means he's at McCord Air Force Base? Yes. Okay, good, good, excellent. Excellent. So uh, he, travel, he travels all over the world to places that are hot and sandy. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Um, did I ever? Did I ever send you a copy of my book? Yes, right over here. I've been reading it. Uh, a guy in Florida spent 120 hours cultivating a study guide for that book, and he has wow. the, the leader's guide and the learner's guide. And uh, if you have any interest or if Sherry has any interest or if anybody has any interest um, in that book, uh, that book is, uh, I, make, I make Americans pay a lot of money for that book. Uh, but outside the United States, the book is free. Uh, well, you understand and, that we, we have no mail service in Zambia. Yeah. No mail. Uh, do you have it in soft copy? Um, yeah, I yeah I can get it to you that way. Uh, I can get it to you that way. If you yeah. get it to me in soft copy, then we can print the copies that we and since it's already free, we can yeah. print the copies that we need for the classes that we have. Because you know Jim Beige wrote a book. You know Jim, he wrote yes. a book about salvation, and I gave he sent two of those before the mail stopped, and I gave it to a couple of pastors, and they used that in working with new believers. So if you can send it to send to it by soft copy. Then I can use that um, as as many copies as I need. Is PDF the, the best yeah. format for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It doesn't. We're not going to change the text, sure. even though you probably sure. you probably spell the words wrong. Yeah. You you probably use American English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You add you add uh, a U there's, and an E. There's a there's a U in color. Get over it. <laughs> yeah, and 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 an uh, an occasional I, and so yeah, yeah and we don't, that's we don't we don't use a Z, we use an S. Z, okay. not Z. Z. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, praise God. That's good. So if, if somebody was going to come and visit you, uh, and if they were going to try to pull off a, a relatively unintrusive visit, and I use the term relatively because any visit to you would be quite intrusive, but a relatively in, uh, unobtrusive visit, how would, uh, would a person get from Los Angeles to where you are uh, and, uh, as safely and as quickly as possible? Ethiopian Airways used to fly into Angola, which is a town near us, and we have an international airport. In fact, that's where I was going to Angola when we had the accident back in 1994. Uh, so there's an, air, there's an airport there, Ethiopian Airways, flies into Ndola, at least they used to. Right now they're not, but they were, they used to. And then Kenyan Airways flies into Ndola. So those are the two from that direction. South African uh, Airways also flies in to Ndola from, from Johannesburg. Okay, so, so Jayburg and, and uh, Nairobi. Uh, and Addis Ababa. Gotcha, gotcha. That's great. Ad Addis, Addis is probably the most direct flight. It would go from Los Angeles, it would stop in Dublin to refuel uh, and then go to Addis and you'd be in Addis sometime and then fly into Andola. 
that's how we travel back and forth. I see. I see. Well, that's that's good to know. I'm I'm glad to hear that. Praise God. Uh, would you do me a favor and would you uh, give uh, our warmest greetings and best wishes to your sweet wife? I will. And, uh, we applaud uh, that ministry that she had before you married her that she has continued. I, I, uh, I think that is uh, I think that is praiseworthy and it's beneficial. And um, this guy in Nepal, he, he just flat out states, he said, we wouldn't have ministry except for our women, because the only oh, yeah. way we can penetrate a household is from woman to woman contact. Right. And, um, and, uh, and he has a, uh, he has a ministry. Uh, it's a women's vocational ministry where he, um, he has two women. His wife is, his wife is an RN and she teaches midwifery to the, to the young women. And another woman is a seamstress and she teaches sewing so that when they finish it with his school, they've had about nine months of intensive Bible training. They've had advanced first aid and midwifery, and they, they go back with a sewing machine because everybody is bivocational. Um, and so um, that's how he, that, so that young woman immediately becomes almost the most important person in her village. Yeah, because well, she knows how to do things nobody else ha knows how to do, both both materially and and medically. As well, well this as is the this is the idea of a vocational school, where again you mentioned you mentioned tailoring. Uh, we do, we teach tailoring, we teach carpentry, we teach bricklaying. Uh, we're going to expand into plumbing because we want to get into air, uh, various areas, and uh, so we're actually and we're we're starting satellite units. Uh, slowly because of COVID. So the school has a satellite in a various, a few places. And we're going to start one in La uh, at a school that we sort of inherited when another missionary died. Um, and so he's working with deaf uh, children. So my wife learns sign language and she interprets in the church uh, all the messages uh, on Sunday morning because we've got deaf people there. Uh, and so one of the things we're going to do is to bring in sewing machines and the school where I where we teach, they're going to come and uh, make it a satellite. So and it, it's the same kind of thing. If we don't, if we don't teach them to live, then whatever we teach them biblically, they're going to lose because they're, they're going to die. Yeah. So, and, and again, it's a different world where it, when people go to Bible college here, when they leave Bible college, they have no income. So Bible colleges that don't teach vocational skills are teaching people that are going to go and leave school and be depressed because now they're hungry. Yeah. So we, we do both together. Yeah. 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 This guy so teaches. What's going on in Nepal? Fantastic. Yeah. This guy in Nepal teaches uh, uh, advanced gardening techniques and animal husbandry. And when, yeah. he helps, when he helps a guy start a church, he gives him bags of seeds uh, hose and shovels and two goats and two pigs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you go. Well, other than the goats and pigs, that's exactly what I did in Zaire. Yeah. Yeah. They had, and, and of course we couldn't, we couldn't talk about this because it was outside the paradigm of the mission. Sure. Sure. So literally we did this without telling anybody because you're giving seed and, and shovels and hose. Yeah. Why? So they can live. Yeah. Well, the, I think the, I think the unstated key to your ministry, which I've observed in so many other very very successful um, uh, missionary ministry, is is networking. Yeah. Uh, you have to be open to uh, uh, you. You have to have a life that is accessible to other people, so that they can penetrate into your bubble. And you interact with them, and then you witness to them, and you benefit them, and they benefit you, and 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 don't be afraid of them. Don't be don't have a sacrosanct schedule, uh, yeah. because you know God interrupts people, and so <laughs> much what, and so what so much of what is important is uh, unscheduled, unplanned. Uh, but you got to be ready for what you need to do when when God presents the opportunity. So I, uh, I I commend you for that. I praise God for it. 
And um, yeah, I like, I like your reference to Bob Hughes because all of his ministries were characterized by the Bible says, the yes, Bible exactly. says, the Bible says. So. Exactly. You mentioned networking. One more thing. Yeah. I, joined, I, I joined the Rotary Club of Laurentia and it <laughs> networking in the community. So my wife is also a Rotarian. So we're able to go places and do things and we're invited to go places and do things where other missionaries are not because we are a part of the community. Networking is so vital these days. The, 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 the old picture with the missionary and the hard hat and the shorts and the big Bible and walking around and being called Buana. So you don't, wear a pith, you don't wear a pith helmet? You know, I, I, have, a, I have a hat from the Sutu. <laughs> Well, I like I like the reason I like I like uh, the the main thrust of your uh, involvement in Rotary is uh, well billing, uh, deal, uh, yeah, well drilling. well digging, drilling. yeah, uh, drilling. We yeah, drill them because you got to have a clean water supply, or else uh, people are not healthy enough to go to church. They just uh, right. they just can't get yeah. there. They just yeah. can't get there. So I. Uh, I, uh, I, I, that's a, that's a beneficial thing. That's a wonderful thing. And, uh, I praise God for it. So let me, let me wrap up this session. Uh, if I may, please, with a word of prayer, asking God to bless you and your wife's ministries. Um, and then we will wrap this up and we'll make it available. May I have your permission to send this link out to every pastor I know sure. so that they might also be introduced to your ministry and if they want to, uh, if they want to email you directly, they can find out. Okay, uh, I like what I saw. Let me learn more about you, and and introduce you to our congregation. Would that be okay? That'd be fine. Good. Thank, thank you so much. Let's pray, shall we, Father? We thank you much for Pat and Sherry, and we appreciate the opportunity to support the ministry there in Africa to partner with them. Um, and I so much appreciate his entire philosophy and approach uh, to ministry. Uh, it's not patronizing. It's not condescending. Um, it's it's a biblical, scriptural ministry to people who desperately need the gospel. And once they have come to Christ, they need to be equipped for ministry. Uh, churches need to be founded, and uh, pastors need to be trained. And so we appreciate the opportunity here. We are in Southern California to support and partner with missionaries who are doing that um, in an incredibly large um, uh, continent like Africa. We pray that you might continue to bless Brother Pat and Sherry and, uh, and help us as a church to be a uh, uh, ever true to the gospel, ever true to you, always exalting the Savior and making Christ's name known among the nations. And for that, we will thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Amen. Uh, blessings to you, my brother. Have a good evening, okay? Thank you. Take care.